Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Podmashinsky. Lecture 4, The Enlightenment, Part 1. Now we come to the period which stands between the Renaissance and modern times, which has a definite essence of its own. One of the classical works on this period, this Paul Hazard, called The European Mind, states, In this period, a, quote, moral clash took place in Europe. The interval between the Renaissance, of which it is a lineal descendant, and the French Revolution, for which it was forging the weapons, constitutes an epoch which yields to none in historical importance." End quote. This is the classical age of modern Europe. The same author states, quote, The classical mind, with the consciousness of its strength, loves stability. Nay, if it could, it would be stability. Now that the Renaissance and the Reformation, big adventures these, were over, the time had come for a mental stock-taking, for an intellectual retreat. Politics, religion, society, art, all had been rescued from the clutches of the ravening critics. Humanity's storm-tossed bark had made port at last. Long might it stay there, long. Nay, let it stay there forever. Life was now a regular, well-ordered affair. Why, then, go outside this happy pale to risk encounters that might unsettle everything? The great beyond was viewed with apprehension. It might contain some uncomfortable surprises. Nay, time itself they would have made stand still, could they have stayed its flight. At Versailles, the visitor got the impression that the very waters had been arrested in their course, caught and controlled as they were, and sent skywards again, and yet again, as though destined to do duty forever." End quote. This period between the Renaissance and modern times is the first real attempt to make a harmonious synthesis of all the new forces which had been let loose by medieval and Renaissance and Reformation man. But the attempt was to do this without losing a spiritual base of some kind of Christianity. That is how it is quite different from what is being attempted today. To make a synthesis without Christianity, or rather with Christianity much more watered down. We will look at several aspects of this harmony and find there also the reasons why it could not last. The first aspect of this new classical age, this new harmony, is the dominance of the scientific worldview which took the form of the world machine of Isaac Newton. The Age of Newton, the Early Enlightenment. He died in the 1720s, I believe, and his great book came out in the 1690s. Quote, when science and rational religion seemed to agree that all was right with the world, and the arts flourished in a way they were never again to flourish in the West. Before this time, the West had known several centuries of intellectual ferment and even chaos as the medieval Roman Catholic synthesis collapsed and new forces made themselves felt and led to heated disputes and bloody warfare." End quote. The religious wars, for all practical purposes, ended with 1648, the end of the Thirty Years' War, which actually devastated Germany, and it quite practically destroyed her for two centuries. Quote, Protestantism had rebelled against the complexity and corruption in Roman Catholicism. There was a renaissance of ancient pagan thought and art. A new humanism had discovered the natural man and pushed the idea of God ever more into the background. And 
the most significant for the future, science replaced theology as the standard of knowledge. And the study of nature and its laws came to seem as the most important intellectual pursuit. Quote, By the 17th and 18th centuries, however, a certain equilibrium and harmony was reached in Western thought. Christianity was not, after all, overthrown by the new ideas. End quote. In the next lecture, we'll see what kind of Christianity this was. Back to the quote. But rather, adapted itself to the new spirit. And the difficulties and contradictions of modern naturalistic and rationalistic ideas had not made themselves felt, particularly in the most enlightened part of Western Europe, England, France, and Germany. It almost seemed that a golden age had come, especially by contrast with the religious wars that had ravaged these countries up to the middle of the 17th century. The enlightened man believed in God whose existence could be rationally demonstrated and in natural religion, was tolerant of the beliefs of others, and was convinced that everything in the world could be explained by modern science, whose latest discoveries and advances he eagerly followed. The world was seen to be a vast machine in perpetual motion whose every movement could be described mathematically. It was one great harmonious universe ordered, not hierarchically, as in the Middle Ages, or in Orthodox thought, but as a uniform mathematical system. The classical work expressing these ideas, Newton's Principa Mathematica, was greeted with universal acclaim when it first appeared in 1687, showing that the educated world at that time was thoroughly ripe for this new gospel." End quote. Another classical work on the modern thought, Randall's Making of the Modern Mind, discusses some of these elements that entered into this view of the universe. Quote, the thirty years that had passed since Galileo published his Dialogue on the Two Systems, that is, the heliocentric and the geocentric system, had seen an enormous intellectual change, where Galileo was still arguing with the past. And we see that he almost got burned at the stake until he recanted his error and then said under his breath, Nonetheless, the earth still moves. Where Galileo was still arguing with the past, Newton ignores old discussions and looking wholly to the future calmly enunciates definitions, principles, and proofs that have ever since formed the basis of natural science. Galileo represents the assault. After a single generation comes the victory. Newton himself made two outstanding discoveries. He found a mathematical method which would describe mechanical motion, and he applied it universally. At last, what Descartes had dreamed was true. Men had arrived at a complete mechanical interpretation of the world in exact mathematical deductive terms. In thus, placing the keystone in the arch of the 17th century science. Newton properly stamped his name upon the picture of the universe that was to last unchanged in its outlines until Darwin. He had completed the sketch of the Newtonian world that was to remain through the 18th century as the fundamental scientific verity." End quote. This is the age, actually the end of this period is the age, of the Encyclopedia in France, a great undertaking particularly by Diderot, to bring the whole of knowledge into one great book of many volumes. It should be understood, first of all, that this very idea of the Encyclopedia is something quite new, that is, 
the idea of bringing the whole of knowledge into one place and arranging it, as in later encyclopedias, even alphabetically. So everything is sort of flattened out and placed just within the compass of a certain number of pages, so that if you want to find out about anything, you simply look up in the index or look up alphabetically and you find an article on that subject. It should be said in other nations, which had somewhat an idea of universal knowledge, such as China, there were also encyclopedias. But those encyclopedias were rather different because there, there was still the hierarchical idea. And, for example, the great encyclopedias of China, which date back a thousand years or more, all these great encyclopedias were arranged so that the first volume was always heaven, then the emperor, then the higher sciences, and gradually progressed until it came down at the very end to those things which deal with earth. Whereas in the new idea of encyclopedia, everything is flattened out. And you can know one page of the encyclopedia and know nothing about the rest of it, but be an expert in that page. Therefore, this is a very fragmentary kind of knowledge. And perhaps only the person who puts it together, in fact, no one person puts it together, many people do, so actually nobody, knows the whole thing. Diderot himself, although he underestimated mathematics, nonetheless his idea of knowledge, the ideal of knowing everything, is the same as that of all the rest of the people of his age. He says, We are on the point of a great revolution in the sciences. Judging by the inclination that the best minds seem to have for morals, for belles lettres, for natural history, and for experimental physics, I almost dare to predict that before a hundred years are over, there will not be three great mathematicians in Europe. Science will have erected the pillars of Hercules. Men will go no further. Their works will last through the centuries to come, like the pyramids of Egypt, whose bulks, inscribed with hieroglyphics, awaken in us the awful idea of the power and the resources of the men who built them." End quote. We see that they had an idea that they are now going to have the final definition of nature, of science, and collect all the knowledge there is, and soon the task will be finished. In this new synthesis, the idea of nature actually replaces God as the central idea, even though we will see that the idea of God was not thrown out until the very end of this period. One of the French thinkers of the 18th century, Halbach, thus describes his worship of nature. Quote, Man always deceives himself when he abandons experience to follow imaginary systems. He is the work of nature. He exists in nature. He is submitted to her laws. He cannot deliver himself from them. It is in vain his mind would spring forward beyond the visible world. An imperious necessity ever compels his return. For being formed by nature, who is circumscribed by her laws, there exists nothing beyond a great whole of which he forms a part, of which he experiences the influence. The beings his imagination pictures as above nature, or distinguished from her, are always chimeras formed after that which he has already seen but of which it is utterly impossible he should ever form any correct idea, either as to the place they occupy or their manner of acting. For him there is not, there can be nothing, out of that nature which includes all beings, that is, outside of that nature which includes all beings. The universe, 
that vast assemblage of everything that exists presents only matter and motion. The whole offers to our contemplation nothing but an immense, an uninterrupted succession of causes and effects. Nature, therefore, in its most extended signification, is the great whole which results from the assemblage of matter under its various combinations with that contrariety of motions which the universe offers to our view." End quote. Voltaire also says, when he describes a dialogue between nature and the scientist, and nature says to the scientist, My poor son, shall I tell you the truth? I have been given a name that does not suit me at all. I am called nature, but I am really art, the art of God." End quote. The deistic God at that period. And one of Newton's disciples says, quote, Natural science is subservient to purposes of a higher kind, and is chiefly to be valued as it lays a sure foundation for natural religion and moral philosophy. By leading us, in a satisfactory manner, to the knowledge of the author and governor of the universe. To study nature is to study into his worksmanship. Every new discovery opens up to us a part of his scheme. Our views of nature, however imperfect, serve to represent to us, in the most sensible manner, that mighty power which prevails throughout acting with a force and efficacy that appears to suffer no diminution from the greatest distances of space or intervals of time, and that wisdom which we see equally displayed in the exquisite structure and just motions of the greatest and the subtlest parts, these with perfect goodness, by which they are evidently directed, constitute the supreme object of the speculations of a philosopher, who, while he contemplates and admires so excellent a system, cannot but be himself excited and animated to correspond with the general harmony of nature." End quote. Again, this Halbach says about nature, O thou, cries this nature to man, who, following the impulse I have given you, during your whole existence, incessantly tend toward happiness. Do not strive to resist my sovereign law. Labor to your own felicity. Partake without fear of the banquet which is spread before you. With the most hearty welcome, you will find the means legibly written on your own heart. Dare, then, to affranchise yourself from the trammels of superstition my self-conceited, pragmatic rival, who mistakes my rights, denounce those empty theories which are usurpers of my privileges, return under the dominion of my laws, which, however severe, are mild in comparison with those of bigotry. It is in my empire alone that true liberty reigns. Tyranny is unknown to its soil. Slavery is forever banished from its votaries. Equity unceasingly watches over the rights of all my subjects, maintains them in the possession of their just claims. Benevolence, grafted upon humanity, connects them by amicable bonds. Truth enlightens them. Never can imposture blind him with his obscuring mists. Return then, my child, to thy fostering mother's arms. Deserter, retrace back thy wandering steps to nature. She will console thee for thine evils. She will drive from thy heart those appalling fears which overwhelm thee. Return to nature, to humanity, to thyself. Enjoy thyself, and cause others also to enjoy those comforts, which I have placed with a liberal hand for all the children of the earth, who all equally emanate from my bosom. These pleasures are freely permitted thee, if thou indulgest them with moderation, 
with that discretion which I myself have fixed. Be happy then, O man. End quote. And again he says, O nature, sovereign of all beings, and ye, her adorable daughters, virtue, reason, and truth, remain forever our revered protectors. It is to you that belong the praises of the human race. To you appertains the homage of the earth. Show us then, O nature, that which man ought to do, in order to obtain the happiness which thou makest him desire. Virtue, animate him with thy beneficent fire. Reason, conduct his uncertain steps through the path of life. Truth, let thy torch illuminate his intellect, dissipate the darkness of his road. Unite, O assisting deities, your powers, in order to submit the hearts of mankind to your dominion. Banish error from our mind, wickedness from our hearts, confusion from our footsteps. Cause knowledge to extend its salubrious reign, goodness to occupy our souls, serenity to occupy our bosoms." End quote. You can see what a harmonious ideal this was, of nature ruling over everything, the mysteries of nature being discovered, God still being in his heaven, although not doing much, and scientific knowledge progressing over the whole world. The naturalist Buffon even said that, in describing the early Babylonian astronomers, that early people were very happy, because it was very scientific. The ideas of scientific knowledge and happiness were bound up in our own day, it seems to be the opposite. And again he says, What enthusiasm is nobler than believing man capable of knowing all the forces and discovering by his labors all the secrets of nature? And so, the great philosophers of this period had only to discover the whole system of nature. And so we have at this time the great metaphysical systems when the philosopher could sit down in his easy chair before his desk, read all the results of scientific research and the writings of previous philosophers, and devise his own system of what nature is. And so we have Spinoza sitting back and devising the idea that there are two parallel systems, mind and matter, and both of these are God. And Leibniz comes up with the idea of the monad. It's a primary atom which is the basis of everything else, which explains both mind and matter. And Descartes sitting back in his study and discovering that everything in nature proceeds from the knowledge, intuition of clear and distinct ideas. All of these systems, of course, were rivaling each other and eventually overthrew each other. Other systems overthrew them. But the ideal of a real philosophy of nature was never realized. But in this period, this is still not completely realized. And science was considered to be the kind of knowledge which would bring men to the truth. This whole period is one of great optimism, and is well summed up in the poet Alexander Pope, who regarded Newton as the ideal. A few words summed up the spirit which people had the feeling people had about the time they were living in, and the true philosophy which was now being devised from modern science. All are but parts of one stupendous whole, whose body nature is, and God the soul. All nature is but art unknown to thee, all chance direction which thou canst not see, all discord harmony not understood, all partial evil, universal good, and, in spite of pride, in erring reason's spite, one truth is clear, whatever is, is right. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, 
and all was light. The Brave New World from Candide. Quote, but in the age of reason, empiricism was employed by a Voltaire to destroy revealed religion and absolute monarchy and Christian asceticism, and by the same Voltaire, reason was used to erect a, quote, rational theology and natural rights and a natural law. Voltaire stated it definitely. I understand by natural religion the principles of morality common to the human race. It contained nothing else. This creed was accepted by orthodox and radicals together as the essential content of the religious tradition of Christianity. With the problem of the moral governance of the world, the age-old problem of evil, they the rational theologians, did no better than their predecessors. Here, too, they could only have faith that a rational order must be a moral order. Some, like Leibniz, took pages to prove that this is the best of all possible worlds. Pope's ringing, whatever is, is right sounded even to the 18th century suspiciously like whistling to keep up one's courage. Others, like Voltaire, were too keenly aware of the injustices wreaked by nature and man upon man not to be revolted by such a faith. Voltaire's famous tale, Candide, is one long ridicule of Leibniz's position. Voltaire's chief quarrel with patriotism is for the humanitarian reason that it seems to require hatred of the rest of the human race. To love one's country, in the common estimation, means to hate all foreign lands. Hence, against the follies of the patriot, Voltaire waged an unceasing war of ridicule. Everyone remembers the satire in the first chapters of Candide, where the hero is beguiled into the army of the king of the Bulgarians during his war with the Iberians. Nothing was so fine, so smart, so brilliant, so well ordered as the two armies. The cannons began mowing down about 6,000 men on each side. Candide, trembling like a philosopher, hid as best he could during the heroic butchery. Brains were scattered on the ground side by side with severed legs and arms. Candide fled as fast as he could to another village. Candide, walking over palpitating limbs or through ruins, finally got outside the theater of war. Dreams for unity of mankind, discovery, mysteries of nature, happiness in earth, progress, golden age of art. Faith in progress. Quote, From the beginning of the century onward, there rose one increasing paean to progress through education. Locke, Helvetius, and Bentham laid the foundations for this generous dream. All men, of whatever school, save only those who clung like Malthus to the Christian doctrine of original sin, believed with all their ardent natures in the perfectibility of the human race. At last, mankind held in its own hands the keys to its destiny. It could make the future almost what it would. By destroying the foolish errors of the past and returning to a rational cultivation of nature, there were scarcely any limits to human wealth where it might not be transcended. Quote, it is difficult for us to realize how recent a thing is this faith in human progress. The ancient world seems to have had no conception of it. Greeks and Romans looked back rather to a golden age from which man had degenerated. The Middle Ages, of course, could brook no such thought. 
the Renaissance, which actually accomplished so much, could not imagine that man could ever rise again to the level of glorious antiquity. Its thoughts were all in the past. Only with the growth of science in the 17th century could men dare to cherish such an overweening ambition. To Fontenelle, whose long life stretched from the days of Descartes to those of the Encyclopedia, belongs the chief credit for instilling the 18th century faith in progress. He was a popularizer of Cartesian science, and it was from science and reason that he hoped that Europe would not only equal but far surpass antiquity. All men, he proclaimed, are of the same stuff. We are like Plato and Homer, and we have a vastly richer store of accumulated experience than they. Men reverence age for its wisdom and experience. It is we moderns who really represent the age of the world, and the ancients who lived in its youth. A scientist today knows ten times as much as a scientist living under Augustus. So long as men continue to accumulate knowledge, progress will be as inevitable as the growth of a tree, nor is there any reason to look for its cessation. This opinion may strike us as almost platitudinous, but to Fontenelle's contemporaries it seemed the rankest of heresies. He found himself involved in a furious battle, and all France took sides in the conflict between the ancients and the moderns. But of the ultimate outcome there could be no question. All the scientists, from Descartes down, despised the ancients, and carried the day for the faith in progress. By the middle of the next century, it was clearly recognized that only in literature could the ancient world hope to hold its own, and with the rejection of the classic taste by the rising Romantic school, the ancients even here fought a losing battle. Quote, it remained for Condorcet to sum up the hopes and the confidence of the age." End quote. At the end of the 18th century, there's one great philosopher of progress, Condorcet, who wrote a history of the progress of the human spirit in which he said, The result of my work will be to show by reasoning and by facts that there is no limit set to the perfecting of the powers of man. As human perfectibility is in reality indefinite, that the progress of this perfectibility henceforth, independent of any power that might wish to stop it, has no other limit than the duration of the globe upon which nature has placed us. Doubtless this progress can proceed at a pace more or less rapid, but it will never go backward at least so long as the earth occupies the same place in the system of the universe, and as the general laws of the system do not produce upon the globe a general destruction, or changes which will no longer permit the human race to preserve itself, to employ these same powers, and to find the same resources." End quote. He believed that the principles of enlightenment will spread over the entire earth, liberty and equality, a real economic and social and intellectual equality will be continually strengthened, peace will reign upon the earth. War will come to be considered the greatest of pestilences and the greatest of crimes. Nay, more, a better organization of knowledge and an intelligent improvement in the quality of the human organism itself will lead to the disappearance of disease and an indefinite prolongation of human life, but to the actual attainment of the perfect conditions of human well-being. And again, he says, what a picture of the human race, 
freed from its chains, removed from the empire of chance as from that of the enemies of its progress, and advancing with the firm and sure step on the pathway of truth, of virtue, and of happiness, is presented to the philosopher to console him for the errors, the crimes, and the injustices with which the earth is still soiled and of which he is often the victim. It is in contemplating this vision that he receives the reward of his efforts for the progress of reason, for the defense of liberty. He dares then to link them to the eternal chain of human destiny. It is there that he finds the true recompense of virtue, the pleasure of having created a lasting good, which fate cannot destroy by any dread compensation, bringing back prejudice and slavery. This contemplation is for him an asylum, whither the memory of his persecutors cannot pursue him, where, living in thought with man established in his rights, as in the dignity of his nature, he forgets him whom avarice, fear, or envy torment and corrupt. It is there that he truly exists with his fellows, in a paradise which his reason has created and which his love for humanity enriches with the purest of joys." End quote. Another historian of this time wrote A History of Philosophy, 1796, J. G. Boole, who says, We are now approaching the most recent period of the history of philosophy, which is the most remarkable and brilliant period of philosophy, as well as of the sciences and of the arts, and of the civilization of humanity in general. The seed which had been planted in the immediately preceding centuries began to bloom in the 18th. Of no century can it be said with so much truth as of the 18th that it utilized the achievements of its predecessors to bring humanity to a greater physical, intellectual, and moral perfection. It had reached a height which, considering the limitations of human nature and the course of our past experience, we should be surprised to see the genius of future generations maintain." End quote. And there's an interesting message which was placed in the steeple knob of the church in Gotha, in Germany, 1784, which was supposed to be read by posterity. This is the message from 1784. Our age occupies the happiest period of the 18th century. Emperors, kings, princes, humanely descend from their dreaded heights, despise pomp and splendor, become the fathers, friends, and confidants of their people. Religion rends its priestly garb and appears in its divine essence. Enlightenment makes great strides. Thousands of our brothers and sisters, who formerly lived in sanctified inactivity, meaning monks, are given back to the state. Sectarian hatred and persecution, for conscience sake, are vanishing. Love of man and freedom of thought are gaining the supremacy. The arts and sciences are flourishing, and our gaze is penetrating deeply into the workshop of nature. Handicraftsmen as well as artists are reaching perfection. Useful knowledge is growing among all classes. Here you have a faithful description of our times. Do not haughtily look down upon us if you are higher and see farther than we. Recognize rather from the picture which we have drawn how bravely and energetically we labored to raise you to the position which you now hold and to support you in it. Do the same for your descendants and be happy." End quote. When we look at these views of nature, art, virtue, the idea, we see, remember the idea that there is such a possibility of man being happy on this earth, of knowledge being perfect, of the arts flourishing, and of there being a harmonious, in fact it even says here, paradise on earth. 
This is the foundation for what has been happening in the world for the last two centuries. All the ideas by which people are living today, most of them, come from this period. And if now this early optimism seems quite naive, we still have to understand why it is naive, why it does not correspond to the truth. So we will have to look at the inside of all this positive philosophy to see what were the gems which existed already at this time which led to the negative, to the overthrowing of this optimistic philosophy. But before doing that, we'll have to look at one other very interesting thing. Although this seems, if one thinks it through, to be very superficial, to be a kind of mockery of Christianity. Still, it's very true that at this period there was a great flourishing of the arts. In fact, many people would say that the arts in the West never again came back to the standard of this period, particularly in music. It is indeed true that this is a golden age of modern Western music. And so we'll have to see, we'll have to look at the positive side to see why there can be a positive flourishing of the arts like that which seems quite profound, also when the philosophy is based upon something which seems quite superficial. And that will be the subject of the next lecture. This concludes the reading of Lecture 4 from Orthodox Survival Course. Please like, share, and subscribe, and check out my social media in the description. Thank you, and God bless.